so, welcome. I hope you, get, uh, you, you had a great lunch. My name is Honza, this is Peter, and uh, we will tell you something from our uh, everyday life, uh, something that you might find interesting and maybe uh, handy if you will get to uh, the position that we are in. Um, so the goal is basically to share some of our, our experiences and uh, we will see. Uh, so what is this container maintainer thing? Uh, I, I will ask first, like, who of you is a package maintainer, RPM package maintainer of some sort? There are some people. Um, so the world is changing a bit, right? You probably heard about containers. Uh, all. Uh, so even companies started to uh, use containers, even in production. And also distribution start to work on containers. We just had a container sick uh, meeting. We discussed a lot of issues and uh, ideas. So even in co distributions, uh, so those folks who maintain some package uh, in Fedora uh, or uh, other distribution, then they will probably, you will probably need to somehow work with containers at some point as well. Um, and when we speak about container development, it usually consists of two things. Like first you need to prepare the container and then you need to take care of the container for some time. So this talk is mostly about the second part um, and we will see what are the challenges. Uh, so first, more close, ah, so it works. Uh, more, more about what it really is, the container maintenance role. Let's start from what we already know, the RPM package uh, role, uh, package role. Uh, it's uh, mostly about taking the source from upstream, productize it, like writing the spec file, uh, fixing bugs, and basically take care of the package and making sure that the package works with the rest of the system and it works well as expected. Surprisingly, the container maintainer role is a bit similar. Um, but there are some differences. So we also take care of bugs that we um, have reports to, and we also uh, somehow prioritize uh, the software stacks or software uh, packages. Uh, we try to make them as, as, uh, as nice as possible. Instead of RPM spec, we have something we call Dockerfile. I, I don't see uh, Dan here because I would like to ask him what we should call Docker file, if not Docker file, because you know we are not supposed to call the Docker images Docker images, but are container images. So that's something we uh, need to still solve. <laughs> uh, but one more important thing is that there is no upstream source usually for the for the container. And when I speak about container source, I not only mean this Docker file, but also some scripts, because for uh, for example making. Uh, Postgres database, for example, to work uh, reasonably. And uh, I mean reasonably like in some uh, environment like Kubernetes or OpenShift, it requires some scripting. Uh, we have a couple of uh, scripts for each image that we maintain. So these scripts together with the Docker file, that's what I uh, refer, refer to when I talk about the sources. And there is usually no upstream for such, such sources. Um, you can claim that the upstreams usually maintain some Docker file as well. But you know they have different use cases usually. Um, so what our team does, uh, we maintain these uh, beautiful packages for OpenShift. OpenShift is our main platform. Uh, we maintain those scripts and sources for several platforms, RHEL, CentOS, Fedora. Um, and for each uh, of these, there there are more versions. We call them streams as well. Uh, these are usually major versions. Uh, for example, Postgres uh, version 10, version 11, and, and so on. Uh, all our sources are available on GitHub, so you can take a look. And now, uh, more about the challenges that we, uh, that we meet. Um, so, when you speak about container images that are part of the distribution, and you know, they are, they are basically um, solving the problem that we need to ship some software to users, uh, these are a bit different than the container images that would, uh, for example, somebody produce in some company. 
because if you produce some container image for your specific needs, you can write uh, all the scripts as you as you need, and you can have just uh, um, you know specific uh, use cases uh, um, uh, for for your specific uh, application. Um, but in case of distribution images, we don't have a specific use case for the image because the the image can be then used uh, in many many. Uh, use cases, uh, so the role of this of developer of such image is to make sure that the image is flexible and it means that it can be configurable. It's surprisingly not that easy uh, in case of uh, Kubernetes environment, for example. It, we should also ensure that the image can be changed and uh, ideally without forking the whole source code, so ideally the user who would uh, build a thin layer on top of it would just add some new files. And also, um, we can think about the strategy uh, in OpenShift, which is uh, very popular, the source to image strategy. Um, so we can uh, support this uh, extension with this, uh, with this strategy. So uh, this is, as, as I said, this talk is not about how to write it, so uh, if you want to know more, there is a nice write-up by Eliška about uh, how to create a flexible container. Um, another challenge that we needed to solve, and it's uh, um, uh, something I already mentioned, that we don't have uh, upstream for these sources. Um, so the solution is obvious. If you don't have upstream, create one. <laughs> so what th th that's what we did. Um, we could create uh, one repository for each um, stream, each platform. We did not because it would mean auto duplication. We also don't use branches. Uh, we have only master branch for the uh, for these sources, and it's because it would uh, still require us to. For example, change one script on three places if we have three streams, uh, and we want to uh, somehow limit this duplication. So uh, we have one repo with one master branch for each such stack. For example, for MariaDB, we have one GitHub repository and uh, all the versions and platform platforms or sources for all these streams and platforms are there. We have the PR that is also running for each, uh, sorry, CI that is running for each uh, pull request. Um, and we test all the combinations uh, uh, at one point. So you can see that, for example, CentOS um, is uh, one, one item here, but it really means that it's uh, testing all the streams on the CentOS platform. And now uh, the most uh, tricky part, the duplication and how to get uh, rid of it. Um, we have basically two solutions uh, that we use. Uh, some maintainers prefer one, some, some the other. Uh, one example is that we use symlinks. And uh, the idea is that all the scripts are in the repository just once. We use some um, symlinks for the scripts uh, from the directories that are usually the streams. And for platforms, we have uh, different copies of Docker file. Um, so you can see that uh, there is still some duplication. The Docker file is duplicated. And also, um, there is usually some readme file that is uh, platform and version specific. So we have also duplication of this file. But all the other sources uh, can be there only once. And in cases like this, uh, that we need to do something different on some uh, version, we just use some condition. And the variables uh, that are uh, specific to, well, that, that will uh, enable us to do such conditions are defined in the Docker file. So the first part is the Docker file environment um, specification. And the second part is an example of the script that uh, oh, there is uh, something special to be done on MariaDB, which is uh, bigger than uh, version 10.0. This is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, some um, disadvantages, like it's uh, still, there is still some duplication. So from the engineering point of view, clean solution uh, is uh, using a small tool written in Python, and uh, it uses Jinja templates. So we can have only one copy of everything, and uh, all the 
things that are different on different platforms or, or, or streams are done uh, using, are, are basically generated using this tool. And uh, I will try my luck and show you a very quick demo of this. So we have this container the repository. You see that there are, there are no specific, uh, you know, platform specific Docker files. There is just one copy of uh, Docker file which includes these Jinja templates, right? As in Jinja uh, statements, or how, how to call it. And if I run make generate, it will generate all the combinations and, uh, you know, now we have all the, uh, all the sources uh, without any duplication and without any conditions in the code. So since now it was all about the upstream, uh, and now to Peter, and he will tell us something about how we do it in downstream. So now that we are moving downstream, first what we need to do is actually get upstream sources into downstream Git repositories. So uh, Honza has shown you the, our two ways which we uh, have the code layout in, in upstream. And uh, since the, um, this Git synchronization between those two layouts slightly differs, we need to first check what, uh, what to do uh, in each of the cases. So in the case of Simlinks, it's quite easy. You have there uh, three Docker files which uh, are generated, well, not, they are not generated in here, they are uh, written by the maintainer and uh, each of them is for uh, different platforms. So you have a Docker file for CentOS, Docker file for RHEL 7 and Docker file for Fedora. And there are symlinks to, to the root of the Git. So what you need to do is not just copy them in, into the disk git, but you actually have to remove the Docker files that you don't need, rename, for example, Docker file Fedora to Docker file, and of course, follow the symlinks on, on, unless you want dangling symlinks, which, believe me, you don't want. So that's the symlink approach. If, you, if we use the disgen, disgen approach, it's slightly more difficult since you actually need to uh, generate the sources be before, which. Honza uh, shown you in the, in the demo. And once you have it, it's quite easy. This time around, it's actually a copy of, of uh, the upstream content into this Git. Everything should be, should be there what's in, in the places that are, that are expected, unless you generate uh, symlinks, which please don't. And uh, once, we, once we have uh, this Git, uh, this git, well, once we have the sources in this git, all that is left is uh, that we run fat package container build and that's all of our maintenance work done, right? Well, no, but because uh, the container images are a static bundle, so if you leave them uh, hanging for too long without being rebuilt, they will end up with CVs and when you have CVs, you have uh, users complaining about uh, having CVs in their container images which they run, so Eventually, you need to rebuild them. So how often do you want to rebuild your images? Well, the answer is quite, uh, quite easy, as, as, uh, as often as humanly possible. But that's not really that easy when you have uh, multiple images which you maintain. So for example, we in RHEL 7, we maintain 38 images. In Fedora, we have like 15 images per Fedora release. So it really doesn't, doesn't scale with, uh, with higher images numbers. So we need to rebuild them. Uh, well, let's talk about when, when we rebuild them. As far as I know, there are no policies regarding this in Fedora, or at least I haven't found any. If there are any, please let me know. Uh, in RHEL, what we do is uh, we have two use cases for when we rebuild uh, images. One is uh, when we do CV rebuilds, which is uh, get them as soon as possible since uh, often the CVs are very urgent and uh, our users uh, really complain uh, loudly about that we have CVs in our images. And the other, th other use case is basically a more specific use case of the first, which is when the base image changes and fixes uh, CVs in, in the base image. The base image changes every six weeks. We usually run uh, the CV rebuilds every three weeks, including the the base image change. So in RHEL, we, we do image rebuilds basically every three weeks. In Fedora, all the images were rebuilt uh, every 
five uh, every two weeks. But that is no longer the case since we got body integration now, so every image needs to go through body, body update and uh, testing and uh, regular, regular uh, body, body um, workflow, same as for RPMs. But uh, we still need, need to get some automation in there. So what automation do we have available? Well, there isn't really that much, that much automation in, uh, in Fedora right now, but uh, the future is looking bright. One uh, automation tool is FreshMaker, which is basically a tool that uh, checks for RPM changes, and uh, when there are RPM changes that are uh, important enough for your container to be rebuilt, the FreshMaker tool basically runs the build, gets the uh, build tucked into, uh, into a body update, when we have body updates integrated with CI and uh, uh, getting the body updates pushed on uh, success, then it will be, it will be shipped to uh, our users. Uh, the other uh, useful feature is a chain auto rebuilds in OSBS. OSBS is the system that actually runs the, the, the builds in, uh, in Koji. If you want to learn something more about, uh, about uh, image builds in OpenShift, which is the OpenShift build service, then uh, please take a look at, uh, at, one of the, uh, at one of the presentations that will be happening in a few hours. Not sure which, which room it is, but it's definitely happening today. So what chain outer builds are in uh, OSBS is that whenever a base image that you are using in your Docker file gets rebuilt, the OSBS will trigger a rebuild of your image and if there are any images uh, depending on your image, then once your image gets rebuilt, then all of the other images uh, will get, get rebuilt and eventually all the layers of images will get rebuilt. So you don't have to trigger all of the uh, image builds by yourself. Now the last uh, bit of automation we have available is through user space containerization, containerization bots. We might have been able to see some of the uh, bots already since there was a talk, uh, I, I believe it was today in the morning, about uh, Zdravomil. Here we will be talking about Bitka, which is the bot that uh, handles GitHub to git, this git uh, synchronization. So basically, there will be a fat message, uh, fat message uh, event coming from, uh, let's say, GitHub and uh, Bitka will pick it up that, that there is a new commit from uh, the upstream repository uh, the bot will then uh, check what changes there are. The, if, the, if the changes are uh, uh, if the changes are for the image that is that is monitored, then it will fire up a, fire up a pull request downstream, and the maintainer can take a look at it, merge it, or cancel it if, if they are not uh, interested in this specific update. Unfortunately, Bitka is not yet open source, but uh, last I've heard, it will be open source soon. So. Once it is, please check it out. Now, the last bit of tooling is for when, uh, when we don't have any optimization for, uh, for some of our use cases. So basically when you need to trigger the first builds or where you need to just check the build status and you want to do it for uh, a lot of the images. So when we are doing it, these manual steps for uh, of all of our 38 images in row 7 or 15 images in Fedora, we will do it through this tool, since it makes it makes our um, work slightly easier. And uh, the main uh, feature that it has is that it uses uh, Git content, that it uh, provides the Git content synchronization I've talked about uh, at the start. So if, um, it uh, doesn't matter if you're using uh, Simlinks or uh, this gen inside your upstream repositories, the tool will handle it and uh, the downstream repositories will be as clean as you want them. Also, it has some, uh, some bindings for uh, creating image builds and uh, getting uh, image informa information from Koji. And the future feature will be body updates if it's needed, but I hope it will be uh, handled automatically by one of the, one of the, one of the automation tools I've uh, mentioned previously. And that's it, that's it from me. I, I guess I'm on time, so we have some place for questions. And I have one question for you. How, do we, how should we call the Docker files? If you want to avoid the Docker thing, word? 
container image files. <gasps> container spec files, maybe. So any questions from you? Yeah. Uh, so I have one question regarding uh, one point you mentioned which is configuration. So I've been using some of your uh, images like photographs and trays. Um, and the way like if I if I need to include some more files uh, into the illumination, so if you interested on this slide I can use the link SPI uh, to kind of extend that. And I've always been using because I'm running that in OpenShift, I've always been using OpenShift config right to uh, provide some additional config files. Yeah, so it was a longer question. I should probably repeat it, but it, I will repeat it uh, uh, sh in a shorter version. Uh, so there were mentioned two ways how to uh, extend the image or maybe configure the image. For example, Redis or Postgres was mentioned. So the one thing is uh, that was in the slide, uh, source to image strategy. Another thing is uh, configuring using uh, uh, Kubernetes config files. Um, so, and the question was uh, which one use when and to, you know what are the differences. Um, so the concept that is written, uh, described in the uh, blog post uh, by Eliška, I think, uh, mentions both ways. So uh, it should be also, uh, um, so and, and the con both concepts use the same approach. So we have some directory, basically, if I put it very simply, we have some directory inside the image uh, where we expect some files, either scripts or configuration files, and we do some something with them. We either, you know, if it's scripts, we will basically run them at some points, uh, or we will use uh, those configuration files uh, that they are used. And <clears throat> so for configuration files, it's probably um, more often that you would use the config, config uh, maps. Um, and for, for scripts, I would say, Users will prefer more uh, the other way. Um, you, you know, if if they want to build a thin layer on top of our image uh, and distribute it, for example, more uh, into into more machines, then um, it would be maybe easier to build a, a image and using using the source to image strategy. So, um, and maybe the the uh, real uh, question is whether you want to produce a new image based on our or not, uh, because both ways are possible, uh, even for configuration or uh, extending the script. And it's really about uh, your, your idea. Uh, if you want to just run the image, maybe it's not necessary. If you want to run the, run the image on 1,000 machines, maybe even in different clusters, then you would probably prefer a thin layer and build a new um, image using the S2I strategy, I think. Any more questions? No, then thank you very much. Thanks.